morning. Um, I am coming on here because I want to share with you a couple of things that I read this morning that I just thought were really powerful in two different ways. One, um, it is a way that we can have consistent spiritual growth. And it's something that when I feel like I have missed the mark or I am somehow stalled or I am growing stale or growing cold, that I always turn to 2 Peter 1 and read over it and over it and over it. And it just gets me so excited about who I am in Jesus and what the Lord has done and provided for us in order to grow. And so I'm gonna, I want you guys to possibly uh, pull out your Bibles or your Bible app and read 2 Peter 1, 1 through 7. Um, I will write, uh, I will read uh, something that I wrote this morning and then we'll just walk through it a little bit. Knowledge of God through a relationship with Jesus gives us access to the glory and virtue he created us for. This access also grants us full incursion into the great and exceedingly precious promises of relationship. It is living inside this relationship and playing, walking, living, breathing these promises that we either by the, imagine, uh, the imitation of our Father um, or by the imaginative play with Holy Spirit, we become divine uh, partakers of his own nature. He becomes our bread and wine in a communion more sweet than any meal we've ever tasted. And it is inside this communion that we escape temptation. That even the things that behavioral modification and, and willpower cannot do. Um, we inside of relationship with Lord can escape that temptation. And doing so just becomes child's play. Because we're imitating our father or we're living in an imaginative, creative world with Holy Spirit as our partner. So uh, I just wanted to walk through real quick um, a couple of things. Now, I am um, a communicator. It is my passion in life to communicate either through art, through the word, uh, through video, through teaching, through preaching. Um, it's what I believe God called and made me to be. It's one of the reasons my parents were so annoyed with me so often is because I would just talk way too much. And it wasn't that I just wanted to be heard. It's that I felt a compulsion to share thoughts or to have conversations or to ask big questions. And now as I, um, am really kind of coming into more and more opportunities to share the gospel and with the internet being what it is, I can do that here too. Um, reading this today, I, I saw what I'd always seen, like there's a, a formula for spiritual growth. We always want, you know, it's the new year. We want to grow. We want to change. We want to become uh, the better version of ourselves in 2020. It's one of the reasons why so many people set resolutions and start new goals and, you know, new, new plans. Uh, and those things are all really well and good. But if you don't have an action plan, a way to implement those changes and a way to grow a formula for growth, then you more than likely are just going to end the year much the same person that you started it. So spiritually, there's a great formula here in these first seven verses of Second Peter that I believe that every Christian should think about and know. Um, now, it starts off, uh, and I want to say that, you know, even if you're not a Christian and you're seeing this, this is applicable to you because the way to grow uh, spiritually and just as a person starts with knowledge knowledge of God. One, that there is a God, that he does love you, that you are uh, someone that he created with a purpose, and that while all those things are true, another thing that was true was that you have this gap between you and God. And that gap was only filled uh, by nothing that you could create, nothing, nothing you can come up with on your own can get you to God. But God loved you so much that he created uh, a way to bridge that gap and that was by sending his son who was perfect to take on the flesh of man 
and um, we just celebrated that at Christmas, and to live as a human so we would fully understand who we are, how we think, how we feel, and then willingly lay down his life as a wage, as a payment for the wages of sin, which was death. And the beauty is, because he was so perfect, because he was holy, death could not hold him. And he came back to life. And that newness of life is what comes out of relationship with the Lord. So you start off in 1 Peter 1, it says that knowledge is where we begin. Knowing who God is, knowledge of God in Jesus is where we begin. So when you know about God, you know about who you are without God. Add to your knowledge faith and ask Jesus into your life and you've already grown. That's, I mean, just step one and two done like that. Um, now that you are in relationship with the Lord, you are now his kid. He wants, like every dad wants his son or his daughter to be a little chip off the old block, you know? He wants you to be like him. And so he wants to begin to change you. He's gonna, we're gonna add virtue to our faith. We start off with knowledge, we add faith, and now virtue comes. And in that virtue, that really just means purity. There are some things in your life before you knew God that are gonna fall away. Um, some things will happen immediately. Some people get delivered of things immediately, while some things we have to work out in, as we know more about the Lord, as we grow, um, there's a process called sanctification. It's just a fancy word for growing more mature and for becoming more like God. And when we have knowledge of God, we begin to believe we have faith in God. Now we're going to begin to live a more virtuous existence because the old will be falling off of us and be passing away and we'll be becoming new. Um, so, so after we've added virtue, which is just another word for purity, we become more and more like the Lord. We add more knowledge. Now, you have to be a constant learner in life, Christian or not. You have to constantly learn new things in order to grow. And so this means for Christians now to be in the word, to constantly be washing your life by the water of the word. That's that's what Jesus does to prepare us to be his bride. He washes us with the water of the word. But he, you can look at a bowl of water and you can look at a bar of soap all day long, but they don't get you clean until you start applying them. So you have to like actually get in the word. So add more and more knowledge. And one of the things that happens as you begin to understand the nature of God, you begin to understand the character of God, you begin to know him more intimately, a natural offspring of that is that you become more temperate. Now, there are three different applications of the word temperance that I want to talk about. One is just self-control. You become more aware of yourself and your reactions. And in one way where you may have gotten really angry because the line at the grocery store was taking too long, now you are not angry. You have some self-control. Um, another application of the word temperance is um, slow to anger. So <clears throat> you really um, are less likely to blow up when things get confusing or scary or uh, you know when someone presses your buttons. You're just going to have more self-control over who you are. It's one of the things that I used to not have any at all. And I would spout off at the mouth um, all the time. And it got me in a lot of trouble. I'm surprised I don't have an arrest record because I literally should um, have probably had the cops called on me a couple times because I let myself lose control of both my mouth and my actions. Um, it's one of the things that I think that is so beautiful about the nature of God is that he takes chaotic things and he tempers them. Um, you know, in Genesis, we see that in action. Uh, the difference between uh, the God of any other religion and the God of uh, Judaism and Christianity is that 
the Lord is a working God. In all other religions, that's not the case. Man works for God. But here we see in the beginning, though earth was without form, it was void, it was chaotic. And God brought temperance. He brought control to everything. He, he separated the land and the ocean. He separated the earth and the sky. He created, he worked. And then after he had worked, he rested. So we see uh, in the nature of God, him being temperate and, um, and bringing control and um, beauty out of chaos. And that as we grow in knowledge of the Lord and as temperance becomes a thing in our life, we see that pattern in our life more and more and more. Um, now, the other thing that I love about temperance is it has this connotation of a slow, steady burn. Um, and a lot of people just interpret that to mean I'm slow to anger. But one of the beautiful things about a slow, steady burn that gets really hot is that you reach a place of elasticity and um, you become easy to shape and mold. Now, just moving through some things that are artistic that I can use, we, we've heard, um, or maybe you haven't, but uh, there's a scripture in the Bible that says that God is the potter um, and we um, are like clay for him. And he molds and he shapes us. Now, I've done pottery before. I've done sculpting before. And one of the things that I think is so fascinating is that when you touch clay, it, it has the temperature of whatever the room is. And so uh, I used to work in a barn uh, when I was sculpting. And so often in the fall and in the winter, that clay was very, very cold. And the way you would warm that clay up to work with it is by the heat of your hands. So heat had to be applied to make it moldable. Now that's just clay, but what about if you're being forged in a fire of life and you feel more like metal and you feel like life is really banging you up? Well, there's this really beautiful process when metal gets shaped in a forge and it's beaten, you know, it's set in the fire to get really, really, really hot. And then it, it's shaped against an anvil and beaten by a hammer. And it stays so malleable and shapeable that even though some things, impurities will flake off as in the pounding and you'll see sparks flying, what comes out on the other side is so much stronger and better. So if we stay in a slow, steady burn with passion for the Lord, then it is so much better because then he can shape and mold us in ways that don't, you know, break us. If you were to hit cold metal hard enough, it would shatter. But if you hit tempered metal, it doesn't shatter. So there, you can't, this is, this is a perfect reason why you cannot stop just at, at knowledge of God. You have to move on into adding to your knowledge temperance because life will get hard and it will strike you. And you, if you have a slow and steady burn, you have self-control, you're slow to anger, then you will be able to weather those things so much better. And what will happen is you'll come out sharper on the other side. So, and to temperance, we get patience, we add patience. And it's just kind of a natural byproduct of temperance to be more patient because you're slow to anger, right? And because you're slow to anger, it just comes off as this beautiful ability to wait. Now, one of the, more than just at the grocery store or more than just in traffic, I wanna talk about how we wait on the Lord. You know, when we have self-control, when we're temperate, when there's a slow, passionate burning inside of us, then we can then wait on the Lord so much better. We don't become frustrated in our calling. We don't be, become accusatory to people who are in leadership, like you're not letting me succeed. You're not, you're keeping me down. 
When we realize that God is the one who elevates, that God is the one who brings low, God is the one who develops us, that grows us, then it doesn't become anybody else's ability to keep you in some place you're not supposed to be. Your submission, your following God, your keeping your eyes on the prize is a between you and God thing. And when you have your heart focused and your eyes focused, then God promotes and God elevates when it's time. And so patience, knowing that he's given us all things that are pertaining to our life, um, that we have everything we need, that we have access to the, his riches and glory, Ephesians says, that we can then turn around and be patiently waiting for God to bring to full fruition the things that we may have a glimpse of. Now, I say this because I, I love talking to people about their purpose. I love talking to people about vocation. I love talking to people about what they're made for. I said in the beginning of this video, I believe I'm a communicator. I'm made to communicate. And for me, communication means being as vulnerably authentic as possible while always pointing people to the Lord. And so in that, I paint, I write, I teach, I preach, I develop relationships with people and mentor them. I am mentored. There, there's all these different layers of communication going on in my life at all times because I believe that that is one of the reasons why I was made. But I'm not walking up to my pastor and going, I demand you let me preach on Sunday. That would get me absolutely nowhere. But what I do is I do, I am faithful in where I'm at, in the season of life I'm at. I'm faithful over the little things, like making videos like this and sharing the gospel, or talking to people uh, when the opportunity arises, um, when I'm a grocery shopping, or when I hear the Holy Spirit say, hey, go talk to that person. I'm faithful to do those things. Um, I'm faithful to show up and do ministry alongside brothers and sisters at my church. I am faithful to pray for my friends when they ask me to. I am faithful to do the things that I know I can do right now while I am patiently waiting. Because in that faithfulness, I'm learning skills and I'm, I'm developing as a person and learning how to submit myself to others which is extremely important in the kingdom. It's not a hierarchy. There's only one person at the head, that's Jesus Christ. Everything else is serving one another. So if I were to go to my pastor and say, I demand you, you let me teach, he would first of all just laugh at me. And um, you know, second of all, make me sit for a really long time as he should because you know I'm being impatient and I haven't learned those lessons that submission teaches you. So learning to do things where you're at, that patience is extremely important. You can't get so caught up in some little sliver of vision that you have caught for your life and think that that's the whole enchilada. You can't taste a, a, a one bite of one little itty bitty nibble of a cookie and think that you've experienced all the cookie. You haven't. So you have to learn to be patient as God brings about and fulfills things in your life. And that'll be a constant, constant thing. If you ever get to the point where you say, oh, I've arrived, you're in trouble. So patience is extremely important. So we started off with the knowledge of God. We added faith. To faith, we added virtue. Now then to virtue, we added more knowledge, a deeper understanding of the Lord that's constantly learning, constantly in the word, constantly learning from other ministers, other teachers, other people in our life, people in our workplaces who are Christians, who are doing that well. Um, and then to that, we add patience. Now to patience, we add godliness and it's a natural extension. When we become more patient, we, we understand the nature of God. A little bit more because before the foundation of the world was ever laid he had you in his heart and in his imagination but he knew in order to have a real relationship with you other things would have to happen over thousands and thousands of years 
And so he's been writing your story since the very, before the very beginning of time, before he ever set this earth into um, order. He had you in his heart. And if you don't believe me, read Ephesians 1. It says you were predestined before the foundations of the world to be his. And so I want you to think about that as we understand patience, we become more like Jesus. We understand the goodness and the faithfulness of God now because he's been so patient to be slow to anger. And, and he's been so patient with us to let us make our mistakes and still love us so much that he made a way to come into relationship with him. But that godliness isn't so that we can lord it over people or to feel superior. That godliness has a function. The goodness of God, the kindness of God, the gentleness of God, those things draw men to repentance. And the way we show those good, kind, and loving things towards people is by being more like him. It is like having, walking around, if you're a rich kid and know, you know you're a rich kid, your daddy's the richest thing on the planet, in the universe, outside of the universe, outside of time and space, your Papa, God the Father, is so abundant in all things. And you know you're a rich kid. You're his kid. And you walk around with all the wealth of being his kid stuck in your pockets. And you never give it away. You have a form of godliness but you're denying the power of it. You have to take that godliness out and share it. And that godliness in 1 Peter 1, 1 through 7, you'll see, add to your godliness, kindness, and love. You have to love your neighbor as yourself. You have to show them kindness. It's the thing that brings more children to the father who all that's all he wants is more and more kids to have a relationship with. He wants to bring his kingdom mentality of love and patience and long suffering and temperance to the world. So the reason I started this um, whole video is because I love this section of the Bible. This is one of my favorite places to go when I'm feeling stale or when I feel like something is kind of off with me. I've lost focus. I need to hone in. I need to take stock of where I'm at. What am I not doing? Where has this growth formula been interrupted in my life so that I can get right back in it? Because everybody's going to fall. Everybody's going to see a place and you know and life is going to become really just full of distractions and you know rather than staying condemned we just go right back to this growth formula and we go okay yeah this is where I stopped I stopped in the adding more knowledge to my life I stopped reading my bible I stopped praying I stopped being mentored I stopped mentoring others whatever that is and you have to start back right where you are there's no condemnation there's just a lord please Forgive me for my lack of self-control here. I'm moving forward. And just get up and do it. As I was reading this today, because I've kind of been in that place recently, I'm, not, I'm just being honest and vulnerable with you. I have been going through some motions rather than sharing out of my own fruit. <laughs> You know, like I, my tree is starting to get more leafy than it is fruitful. And so knowing that, um, rather than just becoming complacent, I needed to regraft myself into the word. And so I started reading this today. It's one of my favorite places to start. And yes, I got all the things I just shared out of, out of that with you. But this is something new that I, I got out of it today. I told you I'm a communicator earlier in this video. Um, one of the ways I communicate is art. Um, one of the ways I communicate is writing. And I am feeling very, very challenged by this scripture because I really feel like um, my pursuit of artistic and creativity, uh, artistic endeavors and creative, uh, creative living is a part of who I am. 
Um, I am not, I am made in the image of a creative God and God set aside good works for me to do. That's not just things um, that I get claps on the back for, for like giving water to someone who's thirsty or sharing the gospel all the time. Sometimes it is a good work like a painting or a good work like a book or an article or maybe a blog post. Um, maybe it is creating a, a spreadsheet that will help somebody um, budget their life and get their finances in order. That's not me. I'm saying that for one of you who makes spreadsheets. But we use our creativity. We act at, we imitate our father in the way that he is a master creator. We create things to make this world a better place, to bring a kingdom into this earth. And we do everything as unto the Lord. So when I'm feeling stale in my creative process, where I can go straight to the scripture and I can look and say, where have I fallen short? I know God is a master creator and I know he made me in my image. I have knowledge of that. And I have faith that I believe that he is good and that he has made me to create these things. And so I'm going to submit myself to him and add purity of joy and thought and, and, and pursuit after my skill set, I'm going to develop those things. And to my virtue, I'm going to add even more knowledge. I'm going to go buy courses that teach me how to paint better or how to write better, how to speak better, how to communicate better in whatever media I'm choosing to do. And then I'm going to be consistently slow, burning, passionate about that thing. I'm not going to only work when the mood strikes me. I'm going to consistently get up every day and I'm going to work. I'm going to write. I'm going to paint. I'm going to communicate in some way because that's who I am. Now, you need to know what God has made for you. What are you feeling passionate about? What thing is he sparking? I want you to apply this to blank. Something is coming up in your mind right now. Apply this growth formula that Peter shares with us in his second epistle and start applying it to your giftings. Now, you're consistently slow, burning, learning, constantly creating, and now you're patient because you know your best work is always yet to come. You can paint something and know this is the best I've ever done, but know that there is something better on its way if you are consistently slow burning and patient. So now our art can speak. It can speak of the goodness and the kindness and the virtues of God's faithfulness, perhaps without even saying a word, perhaps without even being explicitly quoting chapter and verse of the Bible in our work, in our day-to-day -day work people will see that there is something virtuous about it. There's something faithful about us that's different than the people around us. And so now people are tasting and seeing the fruit of the Spirit in your life, and they're going to want to know. You can preach the gospel at work without saying a word from chapter and verse. You need to be ready to preach the gospel at all times, but you don't have to worry about what to say because God can give that to you. The important thing is realizing that work and spiritual are not separate. That we do all things to the glory of God and for the good of others. That God, we serve a God who worked before the fall of man and that work is holy. And that even though in the fall and the curse, we, at work now is we have to toil, we have to work really hard. Things are, we have to strive sometimes for those things. We have to try and fail and try again before we see some kind of success. There's no perfection in work. And I know this because in first Genesis, or first Genesis, in Genesis, in the first book of the Bible, it even God said the standard for work was good, not perfect. So there can't be a separation between secular 
and holy. It is all holy. Jesus bought you 100% and paid for you 100% on the cross. And if you have a relationship with God, you can't compartmentalize your life and say, well, this is for this and you know, work is for here and church is for here and serving my community is here. No, it's all one. So I wanna challenge you, if you are feeling like your work or your artistic endeavors or your creativity is stuck, to apply first, uh, 2 Peter 1, 1 through 7 to it. <coughs> Excuse me. And now that we have added godliness to our work and we're doing everything as unto the Lord, as a form of worship, as a form of you know expressing our pleasure in our relationship, as having fun and playing inside the boundaries of the callings and giftings that God's given us as his kids. Now what do we do with it? We can't just hoard it in our pockets. It can't just be about us and see what I do. Now it has to be about sharing it with others. You have to ship your work to the world so that the world can taste and see God's goodness. You know, someone could buy a piece of my art and not even know why it brings them a certain amount of peace or why they love it so much, but it's because I've worshiped and prayed as I painted and they're bringing that into their home or into their office. They're bringing a, a taste of God's goodness. And I'm, kind, I'm showing them kindness when I share my gifts. I'm not being bo boisterous and saying, hey, look at me and look at what I can do to keep the focus on me. I'm, I'm saying, hey, look what the Lord has done. You know, I started writing 10 years ago. I started painting a little, uh, I guess, five years ago now. Um, so... In those years, I have learned that the creative process means I have to crucify myself over and over and over again. I have to lay down my flesh. Um, Anne Lamont, a writer, says, kill your darlings. You have to let go of the things that you think are so important. And you have to just pursue the things that are valuable. Time with the Lord is valuable. Time with people is valuable. Speaking life into people is valuable. Doing the work is important. And I want to encourage you that if you're feeling stuck in, as 2020 begins, that you look at the way for uh, Second Peter 1 sets up a formula for growth. And you can apply it in your spiritual life, but you can apply it also in your work life because they're the same. All things pertaining to life are found in this word. All things pertaining to your work, to your family, to your inner world, your inner workings, your imagination. All things are found in this word. And there is nothing that is made that God didn't first design and breathe his life and energy into. And we get to interact with the things he made and made make new things and give those to him as an offering. If you have kids, you know what this is like. They take paper and crayon and they create and then they give it to mommy and daddy. And mommy and daddy, in their kindness and their goodness and their faithfulness to their kids, go, Oh my goodness, thank you so much. This is a beautiful gift. And slowly, surely, somewhere along the line, mom, dad, or some other mentor will come and show that child how to grow that gift. Likewise, that's what God does with us. So if you're sitting on some dream in the beginning of 2020, I want to learn how to paint. I, I want to write a short story. I want to write a screenplay. I want to write a play. I want to write a book. I want to start a new business. Whatever that is, you need to get down into this formula for growth. Grow you and all these other things will come. 
And as you develop them, keep on track. Make sure that you are doing these things. I hope that this is encouraging to you, that you know um, that I love you. That's the reason I'm sharing it. I don't want to come across as too preachy, but I'm so passionate about people understanding that they're made to live a life that is full of God's glory. And the way that we do that is to fully embrace who he made us to be. And it's not a more of Dana. It's a less of Dana, more of Jesus. It's not a more of you. It's a less of you, more of Jesus. And then as you and G as Jesus grows you into looking more and more like him, then then what the output, the outcome that comes from that is the best version of you that you could ever be. And every day with Jesus can get better and better. The version of you can get better and better until you are fully made into his image, which will happen on the other side of glory. But there's a constant, consistent gro growth. You know, if the new earth comes and we get to be partakers of the city, of this building, of this new earth, imagine what you get lit, lit up about, sparked up about, so excited about. Do you think that that's going to change just because you step from this side of glory into that side of glory? Or you're become, going to become more passionate about it and you're going to wish that you had developed those skills and let the grace of the Lord overtake you as you can now work on, in heaven, in the new earth, without the toil. Maybe that's just me. Maybe that's just me imagining what it would be like to be completely unhindered by the doubts and the, and the pressures that are constantly there when we are creating the tension. But I know in moments of clarity when I am creating, when something just begins to click and I'm like, yes, Lord, this is where I'm supposed to go. This is what I'm supposed to say. This is how I'm supposed to create. This is what I'm doing now. And I feel the pleasure of God in that. I imagine that on that side of eternity, it could only be better. But I can't live today hoping for tomorrow. As a Christian, I am called, I am mandated by Jesus himself to, in Matthew 6, to bring kingdom to earth. To carry that part that is him in me to the world in whatever way I can through my work. So I just want to encourage you that you can do the same. Um, I'm so excited about what 2020 has to offer. And I hope that you will take this message and share it with your friends. Um, message me if you have any questions and share with me where you're struggling. What you're, what, what things, where are you getting uh, caught up? And this growth pattern, where are you getting stuck? And let's talk about that. Thank you so much. God bless.